Thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm Marlisa Goldsmith. Craig O'Neill will join us later from his home. As we get closer to heading back to school, some parents are already saying no to the classroom. But to keep their kids socializing and learning, they're creating a new type of learning environment. THV 11's Ashley Godwin shows us how. It's a nationwide movement that's now here in central Arkansas. Parents are creating another option to have a safe learning environment for their kids. Essentially, it's just coming together in some capacity, physically coming together and doing your virtual learning. It's called a learning pod. It's typically a group of five to 10 kids with similar learning needs that meet together regularly to do their schoolwork. Natalie Baber created Little Rock Learning Pods after she decided she wasn't sending her kid back to the classroom. I don't know how, um, how it could be as, as safe as I want it to be for my child. Her child is still enrolled in school and will do virtual learning. Baber says this is just another way for them to socialize and get extra help. I know our school personally is just uh, very encouraging and I mean we're just having to come together like all of us it's like uh, moms and community members and teachers and principals and try to figure out how to make this work there's no you know blueprint for this I have kind of a plan for my daughter my three daughters and I'm open to inviting a few other kids to my home if they're willing to come to create a pod Chelsea Hudspeth created another group, the Southwest Little Rock Learning Pods, hoping to find parents who might need extra help. Then we can support them with getting a device or getting a hotspot. All those kind of collaborative efforts is what I really want to see so that we can all, you know, be successful. We have a link to both groups on THV11.com. In Little Rock, Ashley Godwin, THV11 News. Ashley, thank you. After weeks of promising updated guidance, the CDC has released its recommendations for how local schools should reopen. The agency notes that while the virus poses a relatively low risk to school age children, health officials say there is still a lot that is unknown. Administrators should consider the spread of COVID-19 in communities when deciding whether or not to start in-person instruction. As for the new guidelines, the CDC recommends keeping students in pods and having teachers stay with that same group. They also advise keeping broader recommendations like social distancing, face mask, and hand hygiene. It's a warm July night around the region as we've got mostly clear skies in place and we closed out the work week with some pleasant temperatures. I mean, considering this is late July, look at the highs today topped out into the upper 80s to lower 90s. And you can see, I mean, our average high this time of year is about 93 degrees. Right now, temperatures have slid back down to the upper 70s to lower 80s, and nothing is showing up on radar. It will be quiet through the rest of the night. Tomorrow, though, as we take a look at your future radar, hour by hour, slim chance of a shower tomorrow morning, and then through the afternoon and evening hours, there will be that potential of an isolated or spotty pop up shower storms, but most locations will stay dry. Now, rain chances over the next five days, they will be ramping up as we go into next week. More on that coming up. 990 new cases of COVID-19 were reported today in Arkansas. That is the third largest jump we've seen since the pandemic began. 497 people are fighting the virus from a hospital bed tonight, and 109 of them are relying on a ventilator. Today, Dr. Jose Romero urged people to keep to the guidelines, especially over this weekend. We can drive this down. We can see possibly results as early as two weeks from now. So I encourage all of our citizens to engage in using their masks um, and engage in social distancing. Meanwhile, our death toll continues to inch closer to 400. Eight more Arkansans have died from COVID-19, bringing the state's total to 394. You've likely heard claims that our different blood types are being affected differently by COVID-19. With so much information out there, we had our Verify team dive in and break down the basics. Here's our Jason Puckett. 
Back in March, researchers in China released evidence that severe COVID cases might be linked to your blood type. Now, this study mentioned that type A blood seemed to be more susceptible to death and infection, and that type O was less susceptible. That study led to multiple others, which is why we're talking about this now. More articles and claims are popping up after new research was published. So let's break down what we know as facts. First, have more studies shown a link between COVID severity and blood types? Yes. In addition to that Chinese publication, two others have been published, one from Columbia University and one from researchers in Italy and Spain. While these studies have different methods, both found associations between COVID severity and blood types. So we're moving that to verify. Now, quick note, none of these studies have been peer reviewed at this point. That's the process of retesting and vetting the study by outside experts. So that brings us to the next question. Have any reputable studies challenged these findings? Yes. Harvard Medical School published a study that, quote, finds no relationship between blood type and severity of COVID-19. This study was published last week and also hasn't been peer reviewed yet, but it also goes in the true category. And this is where we are right now. Some studies say there is a link. Other studies say there isn't. That is confusing, but it's actually how scientific research works. More research leads to a deeper understanding. But right now, that means the actual question of whether blood type affects COVID severity remains unverified. With your Verify, I'm Jason Pucky. In case you're not keeping track, this week it marks 100 days until Election Day 2020. But with experts concerned the pandemic will not be over by November, THV 11's Mercedes McKay looked into what things just might look like. November 3rd probably seems too far down in the calendar year for most of us to even start thinking about. But for county clerks and election commissioners across the state, that day keeps getting closer and closer as different roadblocks head their way. These past couple of months have been uh, nerve wracking, exciting. It's a mix of emotions from Pulaski County Clerk Terry Hollingsworth as her office prepares. Just trying to think of ways that uh, can be innovative and make sure that people have a safe voting experience. An experience that's going to look different for the 252,000 registered voters in Pulaski County. That number including a spike of 766 just in the past 30 days. It's exciting. People are interested. People want to vote. And that's why we're here. Absentee voting is also up by 205%. Hollingsworth says this year they have 4,705 people who have applied for absentee voting. And at this time in 2016, they only had 1,500. That has been, like I said, the, the nerve-wracking, scary part of even promoting the absentee ballot process because then it's like, okay, how are we going to pay for it? There's only enough money budgeted for 9,000 absentee ballots, which is why Hollingsworth and other county clerks across the state requested more funding from the governor. For now, they are encouraging voters who aren't in the high risk categories for COVID-19 to participate in early voting. We expect between 40 and 42,000 votes and probably as many as 15,000 absentees, which is 10 times what we would normally have. Garland County Election Commission Chairman Gene Haley describes preparing for 2020's November election as a different animal. The main worry is uh, having enough poll workers. Uh, most poll workers are retired. Most are in their 70s at least, and that's, you know, the risk area. So far, 25% of their usual poll workers have declined to work this year, which meant on Wednesday the Election Commission voted unanimously to shut down eight of their Election Day polling sites. Haley says each site needs two to three more workers for cleaning. We would do everything possible to make sure that everybody is safe. In Little Rock, Mercedes McKay, THV 11 News. The 2020 census count is underway, but according to Governor Asa Hutchinson, there are currently about 20,000 Arkansas households that have not been counted, been accounted for. And because so many important things rely on an accurate census count, officials are calling on everyone to take part. In about five minutes, you'll not only complete your census questionnaire, but you'll do, a part to, you'll do your part to ensure billions of dollars in federal funding will be allocated to communities across the state for the next 10 years. You can fill out the census online, over the phone, or through the mail. The 2020 census count ends on October 31st. Ah, uh, from my house, what's new tonight is something 100 years old. 
Something found and discovered underneath the massive stage at Little Rock Central High School, which also serves as a storage area, where earlier this summer, ROTC instructor Colonel Roxburgh was looking for something ROTC related and stumbled across some artifacts no one knew existed. Colonel Roxburgh immediately got on the phone and texted head football coach Kent Laster, who got so excited by the discovery, he had his football players pose for pictures. What were they? Antique footballs dating back to 1919. The dates and scores and victories and championships written on the side of every football. They tell the story of a team that was so invincible they looked for competition in other states, even if it meant overnight train trips. Coach Laster, who was attempting to restore Central to that dominance, wanted his players to know of the winning legacy they would represent. The footballs are not going back in Central's trophy case. Oh no, Coach Laster has much bigger plans. I really believe that Little Rock Central deserves more than a trophy case. Little Rock Central deserves a museum and something uh, that can highlight all the many players and athletes and coaches and give our community and our, our uh, school a sense of pride that spans through multiple generations. Hey, Central made a marked improvement last season, and if they get to play this year, watch out for them. The stage has been set or at least what's under it. Of the 40 antique footballs, Coach Laster picked one of them to put on his desk, the 1919 football, which represents the year that the winning tradition began for Central. And coincidentally, it also represents 100 years since the last pandemic ravaged this country. So Coach has on his desk a daily reminder that you should carry on despite the challenges. We'll be back.